Somebody asked me one time, so preacher, what is your favorite passage of scripture, whatever I'm preaching? <laughs> That's what it is. Psalm 19 is a tremendous passage of scripture. Uh, we all have favorite verses as I, uh, that we use from time to time that God has impressed upon our heart and helped us to get through a valley over the hump or through something. And it becomes precious to us, and it's good. It's, it's wonderful. Uh, but what about a favorite chapter? Uh, God can use, all of it's his precious word, and, and God can use chapters to help us as we uh, worship him day by day. As we begin reading in verse number 1, Psalm 19, as David pins these psalms down to the chief musician, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There's no speech nor language where thy voice is not heard. Thou, T-H-E-I-R, that means the heavens, the day or the night. Verse number four, thy line is gone out through all the earth, and thy words to the end of the world. In them has he set a tabernacle for the sun which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circus unto the ends of it. And there's nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous together. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warm, and keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant unto, from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgressions. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer." Our Father, we come once again this day thanking you for the pure, unadulterated, inspired, inerrant Word of God. We thank you this morning, Lord, that thou from glory to glory should receive all glory from the child of God. We thank you for this tremendous psalm that you put upon David's heart to write as he looked into the heavens and saw your handiwork. As he saw you as the great creator, but yea, he saw you as the redeemer. We thank you this morning, Lord, for this opportunity you've given us once again. We ask you, Lord, to use the word of God and the words that we say to be a help unto your people, to lead us, to guide us, and to direct us every step of the way. Give us common sense and sense enough to follow your directions. We'll thank you, we'll praise you, and give you the glory for what's accomplished. Lord, if it be one that's lost and undone in the service today, I pray that you would do a work in that heart. Open those eyes and draw them unto yourself, and may they see that there's only one Redeemer, only one way to glory, only one way to be saved, and you've made it plain in your book. I pray for the child of God. I asked you this morning to help us to see that we are to give you glory. And Lord, may the glory not depart from our life, but, Father, may people see the glory of God in us day by day. Help us now and use us. I need you this morning, and I give you the glory for what's accomplished. In Jesus' name, amen. In this psalm, we find that the glory of God is revealed to us in three different ways. As you meditate upon and you search the Scripture, and you read these verses, verses that are before us, you will find, first of all, that it's revealed by the works of God in His nature. I despise this term, but yet it's so in one essence. 
And I realize people say it out of ignorance. Nature fixed it so. Nature didn't fix anything. God fixed it. And so therefore God is the God of nature. And God worked it out and God shows us this in his nature in the first six verses. As you go in the second division of this psalm, you'll find the glory is revealed to us uh, from verses 7 through 10 by the word of God. And then the last verses, 11 through 14, his glory is revealed by all means by the workmen of the redeemed of God. We are his workmen. We are created unto good workmanship. We belong to him and we give glory to God. Everything that we do as a child of God and as a man of God, a woman of God, a boy, a girl of God should be for the glory of God. If we get a hold of that fact and use it that way, God can help us. And so all of the, these reveal uh, to the glory of God. And after all, that's what it's all about. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. May each one of us give him glory in our life, in our day-by-day walk as we walk with him. In this 19th Psalm, God is seeking to manifest in the redeemed servant of God the same glory that is revealed in his works. The heavens declare the glory of God. God wants to to reveal his glory through his saints and his children that he has redeemed. And God wants to reveal his glory, and he does, through his word. We have the word of God that God reveals himself to us. You will not see Jesus Christ and the glory of God except it be through the word of God as an individual. Now we see him in the heavens and God reveals him, but God didn't choose the heavens to redeem you. God chose the Savior, Jesus Christ, to redeem you. And so therefore we need to establish that fact. The chapter begins with the glory of God in creation, and rightly so. But it ends in verse 14 with the glory of God in the redeemed. It it begins with Him as Creator, and it ends with Him as the Redeemer. You would think that it would end with Him as the Creator, but not so. God ends it with Him being the Redeemer. Aren't you glad that He is the Redeemer? He is the one that's given us our soul's search and given us our soul redemption. And so as it ends with that, uh, he says he's my redeemer. For no one can see the real glory of God in nature until he's first of all, unless he can say that he is my redeemer. All of God's creatures can say he is my God by creation. But the only God, the one that can say he is my redeemer, are the ones by his covenant. And thank God for the redeeming grace of God and for God as the redeemer. The heavens reveal the glory of God only to those who are redeemed. You cannot see the full effect in what God is really doing unless you have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And this psalm shows us that God receives glory, and rightly so, out of everything. If verse 1 doesn't say the heavens reveal the glory of nature, it says the heavens reveal the glory of God. It doesn't say it reveals the glory of individuals. It reveals the glory of God. And so it does not say uh, some things, but implies at all, some time, but it implies in this verse, at all times the heavens declare the glory of God. And in verse 2, the daytime and in the nighttime they declare the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of God when it rains. The heavens declare the glory of God when it snows. We, smell, we, we see trials and we have tornadoes and we have storms and we have all of that. Do you know how God, how God spells tornado? God spells tornadoes, G-L-O-R-Y. You know how he spells storms? G-L-O-R-Y. For everything that God does is for his honor and for his glory. Thank God I am glad today that God spells all of these things and does all of these things for us. You will look at verse number 1 where it says, The heavens declare the glory of God. 
That word declare simply means the heavens are telling, the heavens are relating, the heavens are making known, the heavens are celebrating the glory of God. And so therefore, if the heavens are making known and telling and celebrating the glory of God, you and I as his servants should celebrate and tell of the glory of God. And so it presents him as the mighty one in his role as creator. And rightly so. He is the creator. It doesn't say that God made up something. It says that God created. If you are going to serve God, you've got to by faith take it that God is the creator. God doesn't set out anywhere in the word of God uh, to try to prove that he's God. God comes on the scene saying he is God. In the beginning, God created. If you can believe those first four words, you can believe the rest of the Bible because it's all by faith. The psalmist believed that he was a creator. David believed that he was the creator because it says the very heavens that he created declares the glory of God. The, 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 the principle gives the sense of an emphatic presence of God. The heavens present a continual witness to that word El, which is God, thank God, of power and of might and of his glory. He's the self-existent God that needs no help. He's the God that shows and expands uh, the skies and stretches them above, uh, showing and making known and declaring and announcing his, uh, his handiwork, literally his production. God created and God spoke it into existence. What a glorious God he is showing us his handiwork. Now I'm thankful this morning as we look to these great verses that are before us, we see in this precious psalm the heavens declaring the glory of God by God's revelation of himself in the sky. Verse 1 tells us it's an unmistakable witness. You cannot look into the sky and say I'm an atheist, atheist and be, and be uh, 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 truthful. Matter of fact, there's no such thing as an idiot atheist. He's an idiot to say that he is. I, I apologize. He doesn't have enough sense to be an idiot. Uh, anybody that says that there's no God, uh, it's, it, it, it's, just, it's just stupid. And so therefore, I, I think about, and I'm try, I, I don't want to drag humor where humor shouldn't be, uh, but there was an atheist standing for a judge, and he took, he took the Christian before the judge, and they was trying, the Christian trying uh, to, to debase him and said they got holidays like Christmas and all this stuff, and said we demand our holiday. The judge looked at him and very sympathetic and looked at him with, and, and eyeball to eyeball and says, you already have your holiday. And what he said, he said, the Bible says in Psalms 14, 1, the fool has said in his heart, that's no God, you've got April Fool's Day. And so therefore I say that's what that is, a fool that says that there's no God. I didn't say that, God did. But I said it because God said it. And so if God says it, you can't be wrong saying it. And so anybody that does not believe that there's a God is a fool. The psalmist comes on the scene just like God the Creator did, recognizing Him as the Creator. It's an unmistakable witness. He goes on to verse 2 and says it's an untiring witness. Day unto day utter speech and night unto night sure of knowledge. Day in and day out it declares the glory of God. And he talks about it's an understandable witness. You can understand this. By looking at the stars, looking at the sun, and looking at the moon. They just didn't happen, friend. God stuck them in the sky and said, stay there. And you know how long they're going to stay there? Till God says not to stay. And that will be forever. I am thankful today to say that he is the creator himself by showing us the revelation of himself in the sky. And God's revelation of himself is in the scriptures, verse 7 through verse 14. He not only shows us the works of God and thank God for the work of God, but he shows us the word of God. You cannot read this Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22:21 21 without seeing Jesus Christ. 
Christ. Thank God from Genesis to Revelation. Cut it anywhere you want to. It'll bleed red. And it will shout Jesus. It will shout Jesus Christ. It will shout the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he is Lord and besides him there is none else. You better love the word of God. You better look into the word of God. And you better thank God for the word of God. Because God's word is precious. It challenges us. Verse number 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. And then he goes on down through that. It cheers us up in verse number 8. Before long, I'm going to preach a message on why look ye so sadly today. All of God's children ought to have the cheer of God inside of their heart. We, I, I know we have sad times. I know we have mourning times. And I know that we have times that we don't understand. And there's times that we question God. But that should not deviate. We should not deviate from. And it should not alleviate us from the joy of the Lord. For the joy of the Lord is down in our heart and in our soul. It's bubbling, it's bubbling, it's bubbling. And it should be there in the deepest valley. In the, in the hardest circumstances. The joy of the Lord should lead us and guide us along the way that's peace like a river and peace that only God can live and lay down deep inside of your soul through all of these circumstances things and others and the worry that we face day by day in verses 9 and 10 it changes us a God that saves you changes you and so the word of God changes you from day to day, from glory to glory. God's word is powerful. It not only is precious, but it's powerful, verse 11 through 13, where we see the works of God, verses 1 through 6, the word of God, verses 7 through 10, and the workman of God, verses 11 through 14. It has power to convict us. Look at verse number 11. Uh, in verse number 11, Moreover by them is thy servant warned. Now, God's Word is precious. It's wonderful. But the Word of God warns us. It convicts us. And it brings us to the place that we look up to Him and say, I have sinned, O God, against Thee. Every one of us here today from this pulpit down has a sin. There's not one of us today uh, that is exempt from doing any sin that's ever been committed. But this church has a sin against it. This pastor has a sin against it. I dare say that every one of you here this morning probably has a sin against you. And that sin is, and I want to ask you a question. This is the title to my message. Where is the glory? God has saved you for one purpose, to bring glory to Him. Where is that glory? When people look at you, what do they see? When people, uh, when you talk to people about God, what do they see? And so the glory of God should be in our life and exemplified in our life and our walk. And it should be a magnet to draw people unto us. They should be hungry and thirsty for what we have concerning the Word of God. If we've been convicted, thank God verse 12 says we've been cleansed. I'm glad God's a cleansing God. I'm thankful, thank God, that He not only convicts me, he shows me who I am and what I am and what I need, but He cleanses me. Not only as a sinner to be birthed into His family one time and one time alone, but as a son day by day for the discipline purposes, God lets me confess my sin to Him. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That has to do not with the work that God's created in us, but our walk day by day. Your position that Christ puts you in when you are saved by the grace of God will never change. It's a done deal. It's a one-time thing. But your practice changes from day to day. That's the reason the psalmist tells us and, and Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians, it's from glory to glory. Day by day. And we are changing, getting more and more like Him. And He correct, corrects us as we belong to Him and walk with Him. Let me say to you, it will keep me from folly. Verse number 13, and it will keep me in fellowship. The greatest need that you and I have this morning is fellowship with God. We need fellowship one with another. We should fellowship one with another. You can't improve on the local church. You can't improve on God's fellowship, bringing His people together, that we can fellowship and talk one with another. Thank God for that. You cannot improve on that. 
And we need that fellowship. But your greatest fellowship is fellowship with God. We need that fellowship with Him and we need to talk with Him and He talk with us from day to day. Now the skies and their meaning show us the glory of God. The scripture and its message shows us the goodness of God. The soul and its meditation deals with us about the grace of God. As usual, why change and why mess up? I don't know how far I'll get, but I want you to know this morning that my heart to you today as your pastor and as to this church is that I want this church to confess before God that we have departed from the glory of God more than we ought to. Has the glory of God departed from us? And I say to you this morning, we need the glory of God in our life. We need everything that we do to bring honor and glory and praise unto Him. The occasion of the psalm is unknown, but it is quite evident that while David kept his father's sheep by night, that he saw the starry skies in heaven, and he saw the moon shining bright, and as he looked at the sun come up on the horizon in the morning, as David looked across that and he searched his sinful heart, he saw that God was the creator that made this thing uh, perfect the way that God had revealed it to him. It reveals the fact that David was well acquainted with God's two great books. He was well acquainted with the nature of God. God created it. He was well acquainted with the scripture of God. God used him to write over half the Psalms that we have in our possession today. The psalm really divides itself into these three parts. Nature, law, and experience, as we've already said. Thank God we see that which is uh, material, things that are above. Second, that which is historical, below. And third, which is experiential, that within. You don't just talk about God, you experience God. You don't just talk about being saved, you experience being saved. You go into heaven because you've experienced the new birth. You been birthed into the family of God and you are doing it for the glory of God and so within so this is truly one of the great psalms of the 150 it is literally bursting forth with spiritual truth and so as we look at this message today we see the first six verses where we see the meaning of the skies verse 1 states plainly that the skies reveal the glory of God he's already and surely made known by the works of his hands Hands that God created this outfit. But you keep in mind that although the heavens declare the wisdom, and although the heavens declare the power, and although the heavens declare the glory of God, they do not reveal God's will. They do not reveal God's grace. And they do not reveal uh, the love of God. Oh, it reveals the creation of God, but it does not reveal that individual thing that we need to feel of God. In verse number 2 and verse number 3, we find that although the universe may not have a language of lip, it is not speechless. Every time you look into the sky, it's shouting, I was created. Every time you see the sun, it's shouting, I was created. Every time you see the moon, it's shouting, I was created. And by no means is it silent, but it yells forth from, the, from above, God is creator, and besides him there is none else. The testimony of nature speaks every language and every witness of the glory of God to all all people. I'm told that that word hallelujah has one meaning in the whole world with all of the languages that exist. No matter what you say, any place you go in any language that you talk to people, when you say hallelujah, it means the same thing. So praise God you can leave here today saying that preacher at Calvary Baptist Church said I could speak a, a, a word in every language. And you said you can't do it. It ain't done it. You said he has done it. Yes, it, I know that's good English. And said it is. What are you talking about? Thank God. Hallelujah. I tell you, I challenge you. Next time you go to the grocery store, get behind somebody and say it out loud and say hallelujah. Watch them look at you like you're an idiot. Say hallelujah. Thank God to the glory of God. I bless his name and I praise him. Hallelujah. That that's the meaning of what God's telling us. And that's the silent witness. Although that we speak it from our heart and in our soul. It's to the glory of God to all people. And so it's an untiring and an understandable witness. 
in the last part of verse number 4, it says, To the end of the world, and them that he has set a tabernacle for the sun. So he pictures the universe as a grand cathedral in which the sun is the great preacher. What a message it's preaching. And it's ever declaring the glory of God as the creator. But let me remind you that the vastness and the greatness of nature should not lead to his deification, to its deification. We are not to worship the sun. We are not to worship the moon. We are not to worship the creation. We are not to worship the things that God created. We are to worship the creator himself. Thank God He did do that for us, but we do not worship those things. We are not to worship nature. The creation should lead you to look beyond to the Creator. The sun is a type of the S-O-N. Yes, it is. What the sun is to nature, Jesus Christ is to the sinner. Because the sun is a great revealer, and Jesus Christ is the great revealer. The sun gives light to the universe, and thank God every other light gets its light from the sun. I'm telling you, and you the S.O. sin is the only one that can give light to a dark soul. It's the only one that can give light to that depraved soul. It's the only one that can give light and show you what you need in this world that we are in. Without the sun, that'd be darkness. Without the sun, that'd be desolation. Without the sun, that'd be death in the physical world. And without the S.O.N., the same would be true in the spiritual world. Because without the sun, there's no life. Without the sun, there's no light. And without the sun, there's no real love. Thank God for the love of God. And thank God for the sun that we have before us. And so these first six verses reveal to us the meaning of the skies. Showing to us that God gets the glory out of His works. Let's move on to the second, verses 7 through 11, the message of the Scripture. God gets glory not only out of His works, but God gets glory out of His Word. The Word of God. If the skies reveal the glory of God, then the Scriptures reveal the goodness of God. Thank God for the goodness of God. Thank God He's a great God, a glorious God, a grand God, and a coming God, but He is a good God. And I bless His name that the Word of God reveals Him as that. There's a sevenfold service of the Scriptures to the soul that's found here. Verse number 7 show us that first of all, it says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And so, first of all, the Word of God is powerful. And so it converts the soul. It's an instrument he uses to turn men and women from darkness to light. You know why you are saved? If you are saved this morning, you've heard the word of God. You know why that you are birthed into the family of God? If you are saved this morning, you heard the word of God. You yielded to the word of God and you obeyed the word of God. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And what it's doing, it is piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow and intents of the heart. So the word of God is powerful. To God be the glory. But secondly, the word of God in verse number 7 is plain, making wise the simple. The commands are promises. Thank God that God gives and they are so clear that a child of God need not have any doubt about them. I, I challenge you this morning. You look from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, 21, and see if you can come up with this word, problem. It's not found in the Bible. And the reason I said that is I'm getting a little concerned about some of the men of God in our day. To hear some of the preachers in our day preach, come to Jesus, He's the great problem solver. He will solve your problems. All you people have problems. And they talk about problems here and problems there. This problem and that problem. But you will not find that word in the Bible. If I cannot find that word in the Bible, you know how I know? Because I look for it. Because I was going to preach a message and I'm guilty. I confess to you, I ask you to forgive me. I was going to preach a message on your problems. But according to God, you don't have a problem. If you had a problem and I had a problem... It would be in the Bible. (laughs) 
And so according to many of these so-called preachers in our day, and many of them, that's what they are, so-called. Mama called and daddy sent and I don't know what else they are, but they deviating from the Word of God, don't have backbone enough to stand on the Word of God, and don't preach the Word of God. And all you hear them talk about is come to Jesus, He'll solve your problem. To hear them say the gospel is a problem solver. It's not. I've had trials. I've had things to happen to me in the last 51 years that I've been saved. My life is not perfect, and I still have a lot of things that's not mentioned in the Bible. Problems. I have problems, but God don't. And I make these problems myself. So I'm making up something that God never intended for me to have. I'm dwelling on something that God never wanted me to have. I brought it into my life and my vocabulary because I think I've got a problem when I really don't have a problem. And Jesus Christ, and don't get mad at me. If you do, you do. Don't make a flip with me. But, but, I, but I, I want to say this to you. Listen to me. Jesus Christ is not the problem solver. In your Bible, in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who have a problem. That's not what it says. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save they that are which are lost. He is the Savior. And I praise Him today. That we need to get back in our life to giving Him the glory for being the Savior and doing that for us and converting the soul instead of trying to say, He's my problem solver. That's the message of the Scripture. He makes it simple. And in highway shall be there in a way. It shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, those fools shall not err therein. Isaiah 35 and verse number 8. And so the message of Scripture, number one, is powerful, converting the soul. It is plain, making wise the simple. But look at verse number 8. The statures of the Lord are right. It's upright. It's firm. It's, it's right. Rejoicing the heart. Many times we may thought the will and the way of God to be hard. But again, I must go to Scripture, not with man's philosophy. And not what man thinks. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, and you shall find rest unto your soul. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Brother C.B. Scares, that great man of God in Danville, Virginia, preached his funeral three years ago. It's been three years. It's coming March. Every letter I got from him, and every time he, he would send me a note, he always signed it this way, in his easy yoke. In his easy yoke. Now, we make things hard, and we say it's hard, and I'm not belittling your problems. God forbid I've got my own. There's that word again. (laughs) And and, and we have those, and and all of us, we have those that we make and we bring upon ourselves, and some we don't bring upon ourselves. For lack of a better term, I don't know anything else to call it. They're trials or whatever you want to call them. But it does slow us down, and we look, and we get our eyes off of God. But I'm going to tell you something. God never designed that to burden us down. He designed that to bring us to Him. These, These things that we go through in these trials that we have they are never intended to get us away from God they are always intended to bring us closer to God for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous 1 John 5 3 Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But not only do we see the message of the Scripture, that God shows us this sevenfold service of the Scripture is powerful and plain and pleasing. But verse 8 says it's pure. The commandments of God, of the Lord, is pure. His commandments are like Himself, holy. They are not diluted. They are pure. They are right. They are holy. They are not mixed with evil. They are only true. They are without flaw. They are without defect. They are right. They are good. 
And those who have kept them can testify to this fact. And like what verse 9 says, they're permanent. I fear the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. They are never out of date. Do you know this Bible is just as up to date as it was the day that God wrote it? Do you know this Bible will never be outdated? Why in the name of God's heaven do they continue over a hundred different versions and still making new ones, trying to update the Bible? That's about as dumb as I've ever heard in my life. If it's, if it's perfect, the word of the Lord is perfect to start with. You don't correct that which is perfect. I tell you the problem is they're trying to correct the word when the word's supposed to correct you. And so I have the perfect word of God. I have the pure word of God. I have the, I have the permanent word of God. I, I, have, I have that God today. Thank God that's permeating in my soul. And it, it, it's permanent and doing forever. It's never out of date. They are appropriate and they are applicable in every age and for every situation. They never need revision. Listen to what Jesus said. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot nor one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 18. You know what that jot and that tittle is? That's that little cross over that T that you use and that little dot you put over that I. And if you can find something any smaller, that would be that too. That word's perfect. That's the reason I know it's right. I know, thank God, it'll last. But verse 10 says it's precious. Precious. Oh, God. They are more desirable than much fine gold, and they are sweeter also than honey. To the child of God, Jesus is precious. Unto you, therefore, thank God which believes he is precious, 1 Peter 2, 7. We see that his blood is precious, 1 Peter 1, 19. His word is precious, 2 Peter 1, 4. And verse 11 is preventative. By them is thy servant warned. This is saying an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. <laughs> uh, my wife got the shingle shots, and I did too. Mine's behind me. I got them at the VA place, got them done and all that stuff. And that nurse was retired, and she was an old rough rascal. She'd been in service, and boy, she was rough. She'd come in. I carried on with them, kept on stitches most times. She'd come down. And I asked her one time, I said, you got married yet? And I thought to myself, I can t answer that question. Ain't nobody to have you. But anyway... <laughs> But anyway, she come in that day and I asked, I said, hey, is this thing going to hurt? She said, for you, yes. And she got that and pinched my shoulder. I mean, she, I got a bruise, I was bruised for two weeks or that thing where she pinched it up. And she took that needle, it looked like it was about that long, evangelistically speaking. She took that needle and she come over and, and she, she never quit walking, Brother Bill. She walked right to where I was at and she stabbed that thing in my, in my arm and, and, and took her ever-loving time pushing it down. And she said, it hurts, don't it? I said, I love you too. And that thing hurt me for about two weeks. Why in the name of God's heaven would I take something that I knew was going to hurt and burn and I couldn't use my arm? Why, why would I do that? I'd a whole lot rather that hurt me about two weeks than to have the shingles. And it may not prevent them. But I'm going to tell you one thing. If they say it's to prevent them, I'm going to sure try to get it to keep from preventing them. It may hurt you sometimes when I preach, thus saith the Lord, don't do this and don't do that. and This God says do this and get right with God. It, it, it may hurt when that sword's going in. It'll cut you going and cut you when you're coming out. But you know what that's for, don't you? It's preventative. It's so you won't do the things that he's talking about here. And you give God the glory. I thought you were talking about the glory. I am. That's how we give God the glory. We, we walk in our life and walk with him and do that that prevents these things. Prevention is always better than, uh, that, uh, better than cure. And so God seeks to prevent us from sinning by giving us his commands. Someone said wisely, sin will keep you from the Bible or the Bible will keep you from sin. The psalmist said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may what? May not sin against thee. No wonder David speaks here of the word of God as being perfect. It's complete. It has no substitutes. It is convincing. There's no uncertainty in it. Everything about it is certain. It is correct. That's no comparison. That's sort of like compare. Why, why does all these other versions compare theirs to the King James Bible? 
Because this is perfect. This is right. And then it's clear. No compromise. It's clean. No faults. It's consistent. No contradictions. One preacher said, I forget how many says there was approximately so many contradictions uh, in the Word of God. But I beg your pardon. There are no contradictions in the Word of God. It's only contradictory. You keep it in the text, within the context, you won't go wrong. And stay with it. So the Word of God was given to show us the way and the will. And it opened up to reveal if and how we missed it. And then there's one other thing here. There's the meditation of the soul. Verses 12 through 14. It's powerful. If the skies reveal the glory of God and the scriptures the goodness of God, then the soul reveals the grace of God. And I'll do that next Sunday. The grace of God. I'm just getting to my message. All of that's introduction. You laugh, but it's so. <laughs> we look at the message next Sunday morning. The good Lord willing. The glory of God. I told you that. Where's the glory? I'm not going to give an invitation. I'm not going to have any playing. I'm just going to cut it off right here. And I want you to do something for me. I want you to pray this week. Seek God's face. And say, Lord, am I doing what I'm doing for your glory? Lord, has your glory departed from me? Do people see glory in me? Do they see your glory in me? And I'm going to tell you, you'll be amazed at what the simplicity of this chapter teaches us about the glory of God. Father, I want to thank you this morning for this opportunity you've given us once again. Seal these truths to the hearts of your people. I love you because you first loved me. And by all means, Lord, I'm not giving the invitation, but you give it any time you want it. The the altar's always open. Someone needs to be saved. By all means, they can come be saved. Someone needs to come talk to you. By all means, they can come talk to you. We're not closing that. But Lord, I feel like I've done what you told me to do this morning. I've shared my heart with your people. I pray and I know that you'll do the part you're going to do. Bring us safely back at the appointed time next week. We will praise you and we'll thank you and give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. I'll see you Wednesday night at 7 o'clock.